So 2020, it's almost over. That's the good news. Boy, what a year. Like I said last week, I thought 2020 was supposed to be a year and not a decade. You know, when people used to say 2020, what would come to my mind would be perfect vision. Who saw this 2020 coming? I, I certainly didn't. So if a year ago, here we are, the Sunday after Thanksgiving, one year ago, if I stood here before you and told you in 2020 exactly what would happen, that you would see something called COVID, there would be quarantines, there would be lockdowns, there would be mask mandates, there would be social distancing, there would be riots, uh, excuse me, peaceful protests, <laughs> lootings and burnings in our cities. The stock market's up, it's down, it's sideways, who knows which way it's going. There's uncertainty in our, in our presidential elections. There's fake news. There's social, uh, social media censorship. There's liars, fakers, half-truth tellers. We've seen all this in 2020. If I were to tell you these things were to happen back in, 19, uh, in, in 2019, would you have believed me? I doubt it. I couldn't tell you what's going to happen. Ecclesiastes 8.7 says, For he does not know what will happen. So who can tell him when it will occur? Kind of makes sense. So I can't stand here and tell you what's going to happen for the rest of 2020, or 2021 for that matter. Uh, but I do have a question for you. We can always look back. So the question is, what have you learned from 2020? Okay. To start our discussion, to, thought, to start our contemplation, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 12, so if you turn there with me. And the title of my message is, A Tough Lesson in Egypt. Now God made a promise. He made a covenant with Abraham, at the time named Abram. Genesis 12, 1 says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in all of the families of the earth shall they be blessed. And what was Abram's response? Verse 4, so Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot's brother, uh, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the timberinth or oak tree of Mor, and the Canaanites were in the land. So we see Abram's response to God's calling was immediate. God said in verse 4, go, I'm sorry, God said go, and in verse 4, Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him. We see it was thorough. He took his wife, Sarai. He took Lot, his brother's son, their possessions, and their servants. And it was faithful. God told him to go. He didn't know where he was going. But we find in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8 through 10, it says, By faith, Abram obeyed when he was called to go to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not, know, not knowing where he was going, by faith he dwelt there in the land of promise, as in, a, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which foundations, whose builder and maker is God. It was by faith that Abram, later to be known as Abraham, responded. Now, I've moved my wife three times. Initially from Toronto, Canada to just outside New Orleans, Louisiana. That first move, you know, it's uh, what had happened is I had finished my master's degree. I had been looking for work for some time. I got a job offer, decided to accept it. So we had the conversation. Hey, finally got a job offer. It's one I like. I'm going to accept it. Um, it's a little bit distant from here. It's a 25-hour drive. Will you marry me? Come with me. It's an easy decision for me. Hopefully, it was an easy decision for Pam. Next couple moves, not so easy. You want to move where and why? But I'm happy and I'm comfortable here. 
Yet she followed. I cannot even imagine the conversation that Abram had with Sarah. Honey, we're moving. When? Right now, immediately. Got to go. Where are we going to go? I don't know. How are we going to get there? I don't know. What are we going to do when we get there? I don't know. Where are we going to live? I don't know. Okay, then, why are we moving? Because God told me. Just imagine that conversation. That certainly took a lot of faith. So it said in Hebrews chapter 11 that Abram had this faith. So where did that faith come from? Because we've just met Abram at this point. We don't know much of his background. So I went and looked at some extra biblical sources. Uh, in his writings, the historian Josephus states uh, about Abraham, he was a person of great discernment and judgment, both for the understanding of all things and persuading his hearers, and not mistaken in his opinions, for which he reasoned, uh, for which reason he began to have higher notions of virtue than others had, and he determined to renew and to change the opinions of all men uh, concerning God. For Abram was the first to venture and to publish this notion that there was one God. Okay, so it's uh, very clear here. Interesting, as Josephus says, he was not mistaken in his opinion. So he had a very strong opinion. Josephus did comment that uh, Abram's early beliefs came from his involvement in Chaldean celestial science. He was living in Ur of Chaldees. Uh, they were great astronomers. Abram had observed the regular motions of the stars and the planets, and through his studies he had concluded that the motion of the heavenly bodies were attributed to them being subservient to him, didn't know who the him was at the time, who commands them. This is in keeping with Romans chapter 1, verse 19 and 20, where it says, Because that may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So Abram had absolute faith in this hymn, this one God. So he was a monotheist. There was a single God. The problem was Josephus comments that uh, his father, Terah, was not. And a uh, matter of fact, in his commentary, he says, Abram was so adamant about his beliefs that he used to cause a tumult amongst the, uh, the Mesopotamians and the Chaldeans. So much so they saw it fit to drive him off at times, and he was of an inclination to leave. There was uh, an extra biblical source that suggests during a, a, a time of uh, great upheaval and uh, persecution towards uh, Abram, that he sought refuge with his great, 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 yes, that's four greats, grandfather, a gentleman by the name of Noah, who was still alive at the time. He lived with him for a while, and there he received firsthand testimony from Noah about Noah's experiences and his relationship with God. So this went to further Abraham's faith. Again, this is all tradition. It doesn't say so in the Bible. This is what the rabbis teach. Uh, further, according to rabbinical teaching, Abraham's father, Gantera, was a wicked, idolatrous priest, and he manufactured idols in his spare time. And there was great friction between Terah and Abraham because of their great theological differences. Tradition holds, one day, Terah was away on business. He left Abram in charge of the store. A woman came in with an offering of flour, asking Abram to offer it to the idols. After she had left, Abram took a stick went through the store and smashed every single idol except for the largest one. And in the hand of that largest idol, he placed the stick. Tara comes back after completing his business out of town, finds his business destroyed. Everything is smashed. He is ap absolutely apoplectic at what has happened. And he questions Abram, what went on here? And Abram said, the idols had an argument. They got into a fight and the big one won. He smashed all the others. Tara cried. Why do you make sport of me? Do they have any knowledge? Reportedly, Abram replied, Listen to what you say. 
Now, Terah didn't listen. He was so upset, again, through tradition, they say that Terah brought Abram before Nimrod. Nimrod at the time was the ruler. And Nimrod's judgment was to put Abram to death and threw him into a fiery furnace. Kind of thinking here of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, kind of a foreshadowing of that. Through God's infinite mercy and grace and protection, Abraham escapes this unscathed. He was truly thrown into the, into the fire and walked out unscathed. So through this deliverance of Abram, it is reported that Terah also had a conversion, and obviously Abraham's faith, if all of this is true, was obviously strengthened. But whether these oral traditions are true or not, Hebrews does tell us that because of faith he responded. So they journeyed as God directed. Carrying on in Genesis 12, verse 7. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountains to the east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the, on the west and Ai on the east. And he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Okay, something very interesting here. If we go back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, the Bible says, And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. This passage back in Genesis 3, 8, it is widely assumed by people who read and study this that God was walking in the garden. It says they heard his voice. Whether God physically manifests himself to Adam and Eve is uh, not exactly clear. It's a speculation. But here in chapter 12, it explicitly states that God appeared to Abram. So this is the first time that we have conclusive evidence, conclusive testimony that God physically appeared to a man. And what did Abram do? He built an altar. He built an altar to commemorate and to, to, uh, to glorify God. He named this place Bethel. We get that from verse 8. Um, it says, and he moved from there, being the place that he built the altar, to the mountain east of Bethel. This is the first time we heard uh, the name of the place of Bethel. So from inference, we take this place where he built the altar as being Bethel. Coincidentally, later on in the Bible, we say, uh, see Jacob having a vision of a ladder descending from, uh, from heaven to earth and angels ascending and descending there at Bethel. So this is where God appeared. So he built this altar. Something miraculous had happened. He had this leading to leave his land, his, his, uh, his, his family, everything he had to move to a land God would show him. He got there and God showed up. So this is truly a, a noteworthy place. So did he stay there? What did he do? No, he moved again and built another altar. Well, well, why is that? Why did he build another altar? Well, it's very simple. Because God told him that I will give this land to your descendants. He didn't necessarily promise it to Abraham. He said the place he came to was owned by this Canaanite by the name of Moore. So obviously he just moved to a location that was nearby, with some unclaimed land, and, and set up uh, camp there. But he did build an altar. And the important thing about building the altar, first of all, it was public. It was out in the open. Everyone could see it. Ultimately, everyone should be able to make the connection between Abraham and him worshiping his God when he's there at the altar. So Christian, do others know that you're a Christian? Do they see your relationship with the Lord? John 13 Verse 35, Jesus says, By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Others are to know that you're a Christian. Building the altar was deliberate. Abram built the altar. <clears throat> it wasn't something that was already there. It wasn't repurposed from something else. It was his deliberate act to build this altar. So worship should be deliberate. And it was dedicated. The Bible said he built the altar to the Lord. So it was dedicated to the Lord. And again, it was for worship. It said, and there he called on the name of the Lord. His worship was God-centered. Abram came in anticipating an encounter. So Christian, you came to church today. You're 
with us on Facebook Live. Are you expecting an encounter with God today? I certainly hope so. It is one of the critical goals of our worship is to grow our relationship with God. And this is based upon faith and obedience. Ultimately, we should exhibit a life yielded to God and on God's terms. It's not automatic, but it develops over time. And it develops in the midst of all sorts of circumstances and external pressures. Just think back to 2020, which you've gone through. Through the rest of life, or uh, later on in life, we find that uh, Abram is renamed uh, Abraham, and we continue to see him building altars and calling upon the name of the Lord. So here we are. We're at Bethel, or a little bit to the, the west there of Bethel. So mission accomplished, right? <clears throat> God told in verse 1, Abram, get out of your country. Check. We did that. Okay. Also in verse 1, he says, get out from your family and from your father's house. So the rabbinical um, traditions say, uh, suggest that Abraham and his father Terah lived in Ur. They moved from Ur to Haran. That city happened to be named after uh, um, Abram's brother Haran. And they moved there after Haran passed away. So very similar to the situation we find Pastor and Deborah in. They're going down to take care of Dr. Cruz's estate. So this is why Abram and, and Terah moved there. And there they stayed until Terah's death. At that point, Abram departed with his wife and Lot, who was his brother's son, so probably orphaned. That's why he went with them. Abram was probably now his uh, uh, guardian. And uh, if we look in verse 5, it says that they took the people that they had acquired in Haran. So these were probably Haran's servants. All the other relatives were left behind by verse 8. Again, they were in Bethel, about 90 miles directly north of Jerusalem. So get out from your family and from your father's house. Yep, check. Did that one. To a land I will show you. Another check. Verse 7. God appeared to him in his land said, here you are. Okay. So God gave Abram a command. He responded out of faith and... Checked off all the boxes, we're good. What's left to be done, right? So Abram just sits back and he waits on God's fulfillment of his promises. He said he'd give him a land. He's going to make him a great nation. He says, I'm going to bless you and bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you and make you a great name and you should be a blessing to all the families of the earth. So all Abram had to do was sit back and wait on God. Is that what he did? No, no. Verse 9, so Abram journeyed going on still south. Why did he do that? Here he had an encounter with God. He built an altar. It's the first time, man, if God appeared to you to a spot, you built an altar, you set up camp nearby, are you going to move from that place? Why? Why did he go? Well, it tells us in verse 10, Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. Though the Bible does not explicitly state it, we have to assume that during the more than 400-mile journey by foot, God led and directed Abram, took him to those places where they could graze their livestock. There's plenty of food for them there, where they could water them, kept them away from the other inhabitants. We don't hear of any troubles him getting there. Yet when he runs into a little bit of peril, there's a famine. God, you promised to bless me, but look, there's barely enough to eat. What did he do? He picks up and he moves. Back in verse 8, he built an altar and it was built unto the Lord. It was God's, it was uh, his focus on God. He traveled by faith from Haran to Bethel. Yet this difficulty comes and he looks on his own understanding. Did God give him direction to go to Egypt? I can't find that. I studied these passages. I. I can't find it. Verse 10 it says, And Abram went. Sounds to me like it was his decision to do so. Now in the scriptures, often Egypt is used as a picture of the world and the sin. So when Abram's faith was tried here by this famine, his first inclination was to turn to the world. 
Josephus comments about this, when a famine had invaded Canaan and Abram had discovered that the Egyptians were in a flourishing condition, he was disposed to go down to them to, to partake in the plenty. So Abram was enticed by the allure and the plenty of the world. Philippians 4, 6 and 7 tells us, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be, be, excuse me, let your request be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Christian, sin will take us down a path we don't want to go, and it will make us pay prices we can't afford to pay. In his account, Josephus also stated that Abram was very afraid of the Egyptians because of, quote, the madness of the Egyptians with regard to women. So understand that coming to verse 11. It says, And it came to pass, when he was close to entering Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful continence. Therefore, it will happen, when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say that you are my sister, that it may be well for me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. Chapter uh, Verse 14, So it was, when Abram came to Egypt, and the Egyptians saw the woman, that she was very beautiful, the princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. So with his eyes off of God... Abram is afraid for his own flesh. He's afraid for his life. And what does he do because he's afraid of his, for his, his own life? He puts his wife into peril. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. If we're following God, we won't make these decisions. If there is a spirit of fear in something, we should stop and pray about the action, and seek God's counsel. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not unto your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Although Abraham was not following God's counsel, he was not seeking God's direction and acting on his own, God did not abandon Abram. Verse 16, and he, that's Pharaoh, treated Abram well for Sarai's sake. And Abram had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys, and camels. So back in verse 2, God had told Abram that he, God, would bless him. And even though Abram was outside of God's will at this point, through his infinite mercy and grace, God did bless him. He kept his promise. He was protected and he was blessed. Furthermore, God protected Sarah because God had a plan. Look at verse 17 through 20. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your sister? Why did you say she is your sister that I may have taken her as my wife? Now therefore, here is your wife, take her and go your way. So Pharaoh, uh, so Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. Why did God plague Pharaoh's house? God had a plan. God had kept uh, Abram and Sarai childless. They, Abram was, in, was 75. Sarah was 10 years uh, his junior. They were childless still at this point. There was a purpose. God had done this. His plan was for Isaac to come along. So God protected Sarah. He protected Abram because even though they were outside of his will, God still had a plan. How did Pharaoh know to confront Abram about these plagues? Things come upon us all the time. Things seem very happy. Okay, again, 2019, things for most of us probably look good. Long comes 2020, and oh my goodness, who would have thought? These things happen. How does Pharaoh know to confront Abram? So here he is. Here's Abram in pagan Egypt. They worship stone idols. They have these statues and temples and obelisks and these symbols everywhere. 
The people revere the so-called small g living God called Pharaoh. And here comes Abram who's had an encounter with the one true living God. He's appeared to him. He's directed him. He has great faith. And as Josephus says, he was certain in his opinions. Um, so I believe that uh, Abram had the opinion or had this, the standpoint that he has an opinion, he has a faith, and that everyone else is entitled to that. So I don't think he was quiet. So when these things came upon Pharaoh's house, Pharaoh goes, hmm, everything was good, and all along comes this foreigner, and I take his sister into my house, and he's out there, you know, going on about uh, how we're not worshiping the right God, and these plagues come upon me. He made the connection again. Christians, do people know that you're a Christian? Can they make that connection? Pharaoh did. So making that connection, God decides to move Abram. He imparts upon Pharaoh, you need to get out of here. He's made that connection. God strayed, uh, sorry, uh, Abram strayed, God has not. Again, he has protected and he has blessed. Pharaoh sends them their way, verse 20, with all that he had. That's with what he came with, and that's with all the gifts that Pharaoh had lavished upon them. So they left. Okay, so let's stop here, sanity check. Why did he go to Egypt? There's a famine in the land. You're now kicked out of Egypt. Where do I go? Where do you go? Okay, don't think much time has passed. The Bible doesn't tell us how much. They had to walk from Bethel, that area, down, down to Egypt. Not an easy walk. Maybe took him a month, two months, don't know. Don't know how long he was there. Probably wasn't that long. Needs to walk back. I doubt a year has passed. So not enough time for the pa famine to, uh, to pass. If it had fast, uh, passed, uh, were the crops back? Could the land sustain them? Doubtful. So where do you go? So if we carry on, Genesis 13, verse 1 and 3. But Abram went up from Egypt, and he and his wife and all that he had and lot with him to the south. Abram was rich in livestock and silver and in gold, and he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai. Abram returned to where he had begun. Was the famine miraculously over? Don't think so. Matter of fact, if you skip down a couple verses, verses uh, in Genesis 13, verses 6 and 7, now the land was not able to support them that they may dwell together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. So the land couldn't support them. The famine wasn't over. Why did Abram come back? Why did he come back? And this is important for us to know. Look at verse 3, chapter 13. And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai. Verse 4, to the place of the altar that he had made there at first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Abram returned to God. Abram had an obedient heart. He did stray, as we all do. But there he called upon the name of the Lord. God welcomes a repentant sinner. The covenant God made with Abraham was still in place. God had said to Abram, again, back in, in chapter 12, verse 1 and 3, Get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in the families of the earth shall be blessed. Abraham fulfilled get out of the country part. Get away from your father's house part. He fulfilled that. Go to a land I will show you. He did that. That's what God asked him to do. The rest of those blessings, verses 2 and verses 3, those are on God's part. God has made a promise. God fulfills his promise. We stray. God is still faithful. 
So why did God allow the journey to Egypt? I mean, we have other instances in the Bible where God has given forewarning about various events. In Genesis uh, 18 and 19, Abraham and Lot are warned about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis 41, Pharaoh is given a warning in dreams about a seven-year famine that's to come. In the New Testament, the wise men are, are warned to go back a different way from which they came so that they don't run into Herod again. Uh, Joseph and Mary are told to take the, the infant Jesus and, and escape to Egypt. There's many, many other instances in the Bible that God warns about future events that we can't foresee. Stops people from doing things. But why is it God did not stop Abram from going to Egypt? He could have. He didn't. I mean, it's fairly apparent, at least to me, that Abram was not trusting in God. He had faith to this point, but again, calamity comes along and he's looking on his own understanding. I'm going to fix this. I know how to do it. He steps out from the Lord. Why does God allow these things? Well, he needed to grow in the experience, to go stronger in his faith. Hebrews 11.8, by faith, Abram obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he would receive as an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going. That is tremendous faith. Again, think of that conversation. We got to move. Where are you going? Don't know. How are you going to get there? Don't know. Okay. Who, who would do that? Abram did it. He did it because of faith. He had enough faith to follow that. And there would be many more tests of Abram's faith in the future. It wasn't until chapter 15 of Genesis that God gives more details on his promise in chapter 12 too, to make Abram a great nation. Uh, Genesis 15 verse 1, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. I am your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. Then Abram said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born to my household is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who shall come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look towards heaven and count the stars, if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord and accounted it to him for righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who has brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit. Again, Abram was 75 when he left Haran. He's gone childless for this point. It wasn't until he was a hundred that he was to have Isaac. So there's a long time he had to wait. He's been through this. He's been through these faith-building exercises with God. Hopefully he's getting stronger in his faith. We see through the scriptures that he is. Yet, here's the situation. He's childless. His wife is in her 90s. Okay, he's a hundred. Are they still waiting? No. Along comes Isaac. Or sorry, along comes Ishmael. Ishmael was again a result of Abram stepping outside of God's leading. He wasn't willing to wait. We are free to make choices. God allows that. He's given us free will. But there are consequences for those choices. Understand that God does not always reveal his full plan to us. It may only in part be revealed if it is revealed. First, First Corinthians 13.9 for we know in part, and we prophesize in part. For strength, uh, for faith to be strengthened, it must go through moments of choices. It's the not knowing that builds our faith. It is the waiting on God that builds our faith. The Bible is full of calls for patience. And here are but a few. Lamentations 3, 25 through 26. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him. The one who seeks him, it is good to wait quietly on the salvation of the Lord. Psalm 37, 7, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Isaiah 40, 31, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. Say They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Psalm 27, 14, wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. 
Okay, so you're looking at me. I'm standing up here. I'm telling you these things. I will share with you patience is not one of my strong points. People who know me, my wife's nodding her head. Not one of my strong points. What are we to do if, like Abram, we go our own way? And we get Proverbs 3, 5 backwards. And we lean on our own understanding and do not trust in the Lord. Remember, God has a plan. He still loves you. He is still protecting. He is still blessing. There may be unintended consequences. Okay, Ishmael. Ultimately, Ishmael was blessed. There was a consequence. I can't imagine the conversation that they had coming out of Egypt. Can you? Those of you who are married, can you imagine what Sarah said to Abram as they were leaving Egypt? I can't, I just can't fathom that conversation. Well, I actually wonder how long it was before she spoke to him again. There's unintended consequences, yet God can still bless. God can still prosper. Remember, God may be using the situation as a learning experience. Ultimately, though, when we step out of God's direction, out of his will, we must seek to restore that fellowship. We should, as Abram did, Genesis 3, verses 3 and 4, and he went to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, to the place of the altar which he had made there at first, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Also, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So looking back on 2020, 2020 has touched, dare I say, everybody in the world. The pandemic has hit every place in the world. There's turmoil. There's upset. Who knew it was coming? There's delay in plans. We've got stuff going on at work we've had to delay because of the pandemic, because of the shutdowns, because of the disruptions. Okay? There's not a single person who has not been touched by 2020. What has this done to your faith? Why has this come upon us? Hopefully, we take this as an exercise to grow our faith. God has not changed. We must be patient on him. Hosea 12, 16, uh, Hosea 12, verse 6 says, But you must return to your God, maintain love and justice, and wait on your God always. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for who you are, that you've loved us so much, dear Lord, that you sent your son to die for us, though we weren't worthy, dear Lord, and only he could do it. And he's done it because of his great love for us. Dear Lord, keep us mindful of that. In times of trial, in times of want, in times of need, in times of confusion, in times of fear, times of uncertainty, dear Lord, we know that you are the solid rock upon which we can stand. Dear Lord, try us, build us, strengthen us, dear Lord. Let us have that faith. We ask that you be with us always, dear Lord. And again, through what we do, the witness that we bear, dear Lord, we ask to give honor and glory to our precious Savior. For it's in his name we pray. Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it. Your opinion is very important to us, and we'd like to have some feedback. Let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m. Our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. 
And our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 10926 Aboit Center Road. We're right across the street from Homestead High School. Uh, just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. Again, thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love.